Um, and then at, at some point they must have thought, oh my God, we, you know, and then they started running. Um, at that point, Danielle had come out and she was next to my dad on the road. When I got outside, I saw my dad lay on the floor in a pool of blood and he was just, his head was just smashed up. Um, his eyes were all bulged up. He was just full, full of blood everywhere. Just motionless, lying on the floor, very cold, obviously no features whatsoever to him. Just really cold, blue in the face and obviously blood as well. So. Yeah. Gary! Dad. Gary, come on, wake Dad. up mate. Gary! Dad. Amy had gone in to get my mum and I, my only instinct was, my dad's going to be fine, he's, he's fine, it's my dad, you know, he'll get through anything, he'd already got through cancer. Mum! Mum, it's his dad! Oh my God. Amy's hysterical, hysterical. Um, and I'm trying to get there and it's like a speed that's not a speed. Um, and when I'd gone to come down the stairs, Amy had collapsed on the floor. Gary! 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 Watch out! As soon as I stepped out on the door, door stepped at the bottom of the drive, that's when really our world collapsed fully. Um, couldn't run to get to him at all because I've got plates in my leg. Um, and the first person really I saw was Zoe, um, telling me not to come near. And as she says that, I look on the ground, and Gary's not moving. He's lay on the floor. I just can't believe that my dad was in that state that I saw. <sighs> he was just full in blood and. His head was just smashed up, I've never seen. I didn't, I wouldn't even think how people could even do that to my dad. It's just unbelievable. I don't think our person could even have to do that to someone. Anyway, the, the ambulance ever arrived in. At this time, um, the paramedics told me to move away and so they could carry on with my dad. Once I'd got my head sorted, I was like, realised what had happened. So I immediately ran out and then found mum crying on the curb, hysterically, and then the ambulance door was open. So I looked round it and my dad was just lying there and then ambulance people were attending to him. And then I just, I knew then that it was bad because the ambulance person shut the door on us. I've never seen even like on TV, we were like doing casual, casualty. I've never seen how much paramedics were working on my dad that night. They were doing absolutely everything and it got that bad that they had to shut the door on me and won't let me carry on seeing my dad, what they were, the work they were doing. And that's when my dad went to hospital. Gary was taken in the ambulance. You eventually got there by car. Tell me what happened when you arrived at the hospital. Um, you're called into a waiting room <clears throat> and all you can think of is casualty. Mad as it is, I'm saying, you're not taking me there. I know what you're doing there. You do it on casualty. Um, and they said, no, no, we need you to come in and have a drink. You then see the consultant who comes in and then he was the one who told me that Gary had arrested in the ambulance. And he said, no, he's just not come back, he's, he's in a coma. But we've made him comfortable. But we really need to get him for a scan on his head straight away. But he's in such a, a bad way that it's touch and go to get him to the scan machine. Um, they gave me his jewellery, which I said, put his jewellery back on, you know. And um, I wanted to see him, so they said they would let me see him when they could. To see him from his toes to his shoulder, he looked fine, apart from a graze. But to see him from his head, um, it was horrendous, really. Gary made it through the night, and the following day, Amy decided to write a letter to her dad. I just sat at my desk and wrote it, but I don't know, it just spilled everything out of me. 
and because um, I, I didn't know how because really it was my goodbye letter in case you know I didn't get to say goodbye um, so I just was going on about how I love him and boy it was so hard because I, I didn't think I'd have to say goodbye at my age to dad I am unable to see you right now as you are too ill but I know you can fight this as you are a strong loving man who I know loves me no matter what I will sit by you while you're in hospital and I will take care of mum I can't get across to you how much I will miss you and I don't know what I would do without you you've always been there for me when I am down and you always put a smile on my face even if it is a rubbish joke. I want you to know you are the best dad anyone could ask for. I love you so much and I do hope you can fight this. I love you from your darling daughter who loves you so, so much and from the whole family, we love you and don't give in. And then what happened after that? You had to wait for those terrible hours, I suppose. I just wanted him to wake up. You know, I nagged him, actually. I said, you know, you thought cancer, you fool. Just wake up, pull yourself together. Don't, you know, don't be beaten by this. And we just waited through the night. As it became clear their father wasn't going to make it, each of the girls reacted in their own way. Up until that point, I hadn't really cried. And, I, you know, I want... Because Danielle and Amy, they were upset all the time. My mum was, like, really weepy and everyone was in a state of shock and... I just didn't know how to act, and the second I saw my dad in, like, um, in the hospital bed, I just broke down crying, and I couldn't... Sp like, Amy and Danielle were there chatting away and holding his hand and, you know, giving him hugs and kisses, and I couldn't. I couldn't even stand near the bed. I had to go back out the room, calm myself down, and I broke down every time I went back into the room to try and say goodbye, I just couldn't. So in the end, I, I never really said anything. I said goodbye, but I didn't, like... Amy read a letter out, and Danielle was talking to me, but I couldn't say anything. And you were holding him as he died? Yes, I lay, lay on him. Um, and uh, the nurse, fantastic staff that they, they had there, it was just, just, I just remember him saying, are you ready? And uh, they turned the machine off and he stopped breathing. Um, and I just screamed and screamed and screamed. Uh, they had to tear me off Gary. Um, and I physically could not take any more. So this is a man who survived cancer and then lost his life through a mindless act of violence? Yes. And you watched him go? Yes, I did. I watched him go. Um, I saw his injuries. Um, and then had to to go back and do the hardest thing again um, is, <clears throat> is to go back and tell your children that the dad's not going to walk through the door again. Gary Newlove died from his injuries two days after being attacked. He was 47. Coming up, while a family grieved, the death of Gary Newlove was to spark a national outcry. It was just such a sad cowardly, vicious attack on a man who was doing the right thing, going out, challenging our social behaviour. The death of a father, murdered for challenging yobs for their antisocial behaviour, horrified the country. In life, he had been an unassuming family man. In death, a symbol of a broken society. In the street, the father who fought back against the thugs. Tonight, police continue to question six teenagers over his death. I think people looked at what happened to Gary and they thought that could have been them. This was a dad of three, a respectable dad of three, who'd only gone outside to remonstrate with some children, some teenagers. It hit home because people realised it could have been them. I was shocked, I was uh, very sad, and this was an area that was very dear to me. I'd served as a local beat officer, I'd served there in CID. Um, I couldn't quite believe this had happened within the policing area that we had. Um, it was just such a sad, cowardly, vicious attack on a man who was doing the right thing, going out, challenging our social behaviour. The family obviously were absolutely um, devastated. 
um, uh, you know, so much so that you would probably describe it as almost hysterical. Um, those first few days were very, very dark, I think, for, for Helen and the girls, and I think they only coped because, you know, they've, they have got such a close family. The next morning I, I went to see Helen and the family at the home address. It, it was difficult. Um, I can still picture I've never seen so much devastation within a the room. There was upset, there was distress. The children were obviously very upset. And I spoke to Helen, and I can remember my first reaction as a human being was to say sorry. It was an ordinary street, um, it was an ordinary family, uh, but it was also about an ordinary guy who'd gone out uh, trying to protect his family in a way to remonstrate with, with local youths and the sort of dilemma that lots of people face when they hear about things or see uh, young people misbehaving um, or involved in crime, what to do, whether to actually intervene. The police were quick to make breakthroughs. The police were immediately called to the scene and uh, the, the youths ran off from the station road area up to, uh, to the shops at Fernhead, Insel Road shops, uh, and there's a PCSO on duty there who stop-checked two youths, uh, a lad called Stephen Sorton and a lad called Jordan Cunliffe. And he spoke to them and he noticed that one of the youths was only wearing one shoe uh, and he told him that he'd left a shoe behind in Valiant Park. The other youth wasn't wearing any shoes. Um, when further up, police officers attended the scene, then we found a, a shoe that was lying by the side of Gary Newlove's body, which immediately drew our interest to these two youths. And subsequently, uh, intelligence checks were made, and uh, we visited their address, and they, they were in the address, and they were subsequently arrested there and taken to uh, the police station. A third suspect was 19-year-old Adam Swellings. He was already well known to police and had several convictions for violent assaults and antisocial behaviour. We knew the following day that, uh, that, that Swellings had been with them and um, at that particular time we, we didn't know uh, where he was. But we tracked him down uh, and arrested him on the Monday evening. He was uh, at, at crew at the time and uh, was brought to the custody suite on, late on Monday afternoon. Had you been drinking that day? Oh, Did you cause any damage to any of the cars on the station? Obviously, at the early stage of the investigation, I established that they were, the, these guys were going to probably put forward that they weren't of a violent disposition. Uh, so it was important for us to, to identify that they were uh, and to, to uh, be able to paint an accurate picture of their behaviour, not only on that particular evening, but over the weeks leading up to the uh, assault. And there was a consistent pattern of these youths being involved in consuming large amounts of high volume alcohol such as cider and then engaging with any person who they met within the community who dared to speak to them or or anyone who dared to disrespect them I think is the word that they, they used I think one of the words used was he, he was disrespectful yeah although police seemed to have detained the suspects quickly there were criticisms that the force had not responded firmly enough to earlier complaints from residents during the months before the attack locals had become more and more concerned about the behaviour of these gangs. There was some criticism of Cheshire Police at the time, and rightly so. Uh, these boys had been in the area many times before, and neighbours had complained about them, and they'd called the police. And they felt that very little was being done. Now, the police, to be fair, did have their hands tied to a degree, and this was a problem across the country. But that didn't change the fact that Gary Newlove had died at the hands of some yobs that the police had been aware of in the past. In fact, Adam Swellings had only been released from jail on the morning of the attack after pleading guilty to a violent assault on another man. He'd been bailed by magistrates against police advice, with the condition that he stayed out of Warrington. Stephen Sorton, 17, had a previous reprimand for assault and Jordan Cunliffe, 16, was known to police for shoplifting. But while the police interviewed suspects and built up a better idea of what had happened that night, a family was grieving. So, Helen, how as a family did you get through those first few days after the attack? Um, it was a bit of a whirl. I didn't sleep. Oh, my sister was really concerned because I wasn't sleeping. And the local GP came out and gave me some tablets, which I didn't really want to take. I slept with Gary's T-shirt. I uh, just kept smelling his pillow. Um, and we just kind of functioned in a robotic way, really, the girls and I. You feel you're going to wake up.